A special welcome to you all uh, today. It's good to see uh, some of the team from the broader ministry as well, yeah? So we want to welcome you guys as well. Uh, familiar faces, uh, we see you every day. It's always good to see you here as well. So a warm welcome to you. Any other visitors, first-time visitors this morning? Just put up your hand, anyone? Yeah, for the first time? Okay, welcome, sir. Good to, for you to be with us this morning as well. Praise the Lord. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. It's always good, and I love that song, Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere, and that's always so true. And as David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. If you have your Bible, do turn with me to Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30 this morning. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 27 to 30. Over the past few months, we've been dealing with the Beatitudes, uh, the Beatitudes of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount that is from Matthew chapter 5 through to 7, and I've been not going necessarily in chronological order, but I've been touching on important and wonderful truths that Jesus has been speaking And it's all about how we as children of the kingdom uh, are to live uh, in the kingdom. And this morning, um, I always say you, we can't just cherry pick the word of God and take the parts we like or might seem comfortable with, uh, but we've got to take the whole counsel of God in order to be whole people. So this morning, I want to minister a little on this The title of my message is Moving from Lust to Life. Moving from Lust to Life. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 29 says, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And we'll touch on some of these things in a moment. And as I said, I put in the WhatsApp message, and this is a a very, very important message for the church today. Uh, This message is written to the church. It's written to believers. And so we need to take earnest heed of it. And the idea to bring us to a place of life. Uh, Remember, one of the... two main reasons, uh, well, there's a few main reasons why we gather together, uh, of course, to encourage one another, to build one another up. But one of my jobs uh, is to equip the saints for works of ministry. So sometimes I think maybe directly applicable to me, it could be an area I'm struggling with, but it also could be an area where you know of someone who's struggling in and you can also then help them. Okay, so that's where we're at this morning. Um, It can be be a bit of a a difficult subject to deal with in church, uh, but it's a necessary, a very, very necessary topic that needs to be discussed. And as I put on the message, and I was just looking at it the other day, is that um, Pure Desire Ministries, Uh, That is a pastor who's been delivered from pornography um, and he heads up this ministry and helps others as well. Um, And I like that name, Pure Desire Ministries, because we are made for sexual intimacy. We are made with sexual desires. So... God doesn't tell us to remove sexual desire, but what the Bible does teach 
is that we need to use these gifts that God has given us in a way that first honors God, that honors your own body and your own self, and honors and in love towards one another. So that, that is key. If you can remember those things when we're talking about these things, how do I honor God with my body, present myself as a living sacrifice, as the Bible says, honor myself, and then act in love towards others, because that's what we're called to do. So pure desire, ministries, and but quoting from the Barna Group, which does a lot of research, um, especially into church things, uh, their studies have found, um, I'm speaking more in a Western context, that over 60% of young people and adults around about there use pornography on a regular basis. Um, I'm just speaking openly this morning. Jesus speaks openly about it, but I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up front, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, over 60%, and he carries on to say that this does not just relate to the unchurched. In fact, the use of pornography and all of the sort of stuff that is readily available, sadly, tragically, uh, especially in a country like this, uh, where there's so much problems relating to this, uh, it is tragic that government hasn't put some curbs on it as to who can access it and so forth. It's just freely of it. little kids can access it, and they do. And so, but we need to be mindful of these things to be forewarned, as I say, is to be forearmed. But there are Christian leaders, Christians from all walks of life, young people, where the use of pornography is actually rife. It's a conversation that really needs to be had. And uh, for this week, we've got Pastor Nubi here next week, but I uh, will touch on it further uh, from the life or the example of David and Bathsheba, just to see how subtly it can creep in. But let's have a look at this, and I want to touch on this and approach it this morning. Uh, it's not a counseling session, and that has its place. But I want to touch on it as a matter of the heart. Listen to what Jesus said over there. He says, you've heard that you shall not commit adultery. That's the deed. But I just want to say to you that adultery really starts when you look at a woman struck man. It's, it's amazing as well. The statistics of women who use pornography is also very high. Sometimes we think it's only a man problem. It's not. It's across the board. Okay, he who looks at a woman lustfully, okay, we can't help seeing one another, that's not what Jesus is saying, or other people, but if you lust after, if you desire with an illicit greed to have, that is then lust, and we'll touch on these things in a moment. You've already committed adultery in your heart. Psalm 51 is a beautiful psalm of repentance from David. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I just want to mention it, and I want to approach the topic from as a matter of the heart this morning, because what is in the heart actually flows out and has impact on everything we think about and do. So Jesus said, it's already a heart problem if you're doing these things. There's something wrong. And he goes on to speak some severe words and, and grave warnings about if one continues in this. And let me just say here yeah, that the reason Christians are not only comforted and encouraged and built up and everything, but moreover warned, it's not because God wants to get you out of the kingdom, it's because he wants to keep you in the kingdom. <laughs> He wants to ensure that you stand before him and are with him one day in heaven. And thus the, the, the sober warning we have here. In fact, Jesus is using what we call hyperbole. Let me give you an example so we can understand what is happening over here. 
In another place, Jesus said, and after everyone had been following and the crowds had been following him, he said, I want to tell you something. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And even the close disciples were shocked. But Jesus explained to them that the words I speak to you are spirit. But he spoke that to make an impact. And the Lord speaks this to make an impact because the soul can be put into danger. Tremendous danger. And therefore Jesus uses this language uh, that we can understand. He's not saying go and chop off your hand or go pluck your eye physically out. But he's using this language so that we can understand just how serious, how severe this and these things can lead to uh, if we don't address them uh, in the correct way. How can we move from lust to life, from lust to pure desire? And I like that. As I say, I like pure desire ministries, and it's a, it's, it's a website you can go onto. I'll touch on a bit later that you can actually join groups and get help uh, from them. But that's their, guy, or that's their goal, to move people from a lustful thing, a bondage thing, and to move them to pure desire and the gift that God has created them, each one of us with. So let's just have a look at this and approach it first. And one of the things that David said after that, he said, create in me... A clean heart, O oh Lord. David recognized afterwards this is a matter of the heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51. And he carries on to say, You desire truth in the inward parts. David there confesses his sin. He repents of his sin. And he restores his relationship after this terrible thing that he had done, pleading with God, calling upon the Lord, not to take his spirit from him, to wash him and he would be clean, and so forth. I want to share four things that can help us this morning, I trust. First of all, we need to understand the origins of temptation and sin, how it starts, Secondly, we need to take personal responsibility to deal with the problem. Thirdly, we need to believe. This is not only with things like sexual immorality, uh, but also we need to approach it or believe that temptation and sin can be resisted and overcome. I mean, the Bible would not tell us and warn us and give us all of this instruction if it was something that we could not get victory over. So we need to approach this, whether for ourselves or whether for others, we're helping others. We need to be able to tell ourselves and others, you can overcome this thing. Because it's a terrible thing and we need to overcome it. 1 John 2.16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That is the roots of sin. That is the roots of temptation, uh, if you like, as spoken there. The three aspects, the lust of the flesh, what my physical sinful body, if you could put it that way, uh, uh, sin in the flesh desires, which we need to put to death, uh, what our eyes desire to see, and the pride of life. Those three elements were there right in the beginning of time, even in the Garden of Eden. Remember when Satan tempted Eve? She saw that the, uh, the, the tree was good for food. It was pleasing to the eye. And it was desirable to make one wise. That's the pride bit. And so these three elements we need to recognize. But as the Apostle John says, that is not of the Father. The world operates like that. They're governed by basic instincts. But we as the children of the kingdom, as the children of God, 
need to live in holiness before God. So first, we need to understand the origins of temptation and sin. I'm going to go into it a little more. But James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. Now often people will tell you, no, I just fell into sin. I don't know why I did it. <laughs> I don't know how I got pregnant. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Now, that is a lie. My Bible tells me that sin and temptation is a process. Temptation is a process. Temptation itself is not sin. We will all be tempted. And as one person said, we can't stop the birds of the uh, flying over our heads, but we can stop them nesting in our hair. That's the difference. But there's a process. We don't just fall into sin. We don't just commit adultery. We don't just get heavy addicted to pornography or whatever else it is. There's a process, and we need to identify the process so that we can get the victory over it. James chapter 1.13 says, Let no one say, no man, say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Not only physical death, but eternal death in hell if it's not dealt with. So temptation and sin is a, a process. It does, doesn't just happen, and we need to understand that. Uh, Jesus was tempted, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, 4.15, in every manner as we were tempted or will ever be tempted, yet without sin. So temptation itself is not sin. Now, the scripture I've just read, we need to distinguish, and sometimes the English translation is not always, it doesn't always give it as clear a picture as it should. God tests the righteous. God tested Abraham. Uh, God will allow us to be tested that our faith can be purified, and we touched on this on Wednesday. But God doesn't tempt any person to do evil that is somehow enticing you or using the devil to entice you away. Uh, no, God cannot be tempted with evil. And so we need to understand, and I'm leading to my next point over here, before we take responsibility of how this thing happens, and that we can address the thing timelessly. The other day I was looking at something on the internet, and uh, a legitimate thing and it said, well, to get more information, just click on this link. And uh, despite my Google being set on security and all sorts of stuff, I clicked on the link and boom, yeah, comes a, a picture with a whole lot of little pornographic pictures. I've never seen that before, but, but I, I quickly saw what it was and I quickly switched it off. So we will get pop-ups. We will see things now and then that get put before us. Uh, but the good, there's a good thing called a five-second rule. Okay, give yourself five seconds max to get rid of that thing. Because if you dwell on it, if you start looking at it more, you're going to be enticed, you're going to be drawn into it, and the Bible says that process is going to lead to sin. So that we need to understand. And I just want to be a bit real with you this morning. All men, all men, women, will be tempted, but it's up to us whether or not we give place to the devil. That's why the word says, in the don't give place to the devil. Secondly, this morning, so understand the origins of temptation. It comes from the fall of man, the sinful nature. Is take personal responsibility to deal with the problem. In fact, the first step to any spiritual, obviously physical, healing as well because of sin is confession. It's acknowledgement. It's to admit I've sinned. Without that, 
Uh, you know, you get many different people. Uh, I've heard all sorts of excuses, you know, but it's, it's others because of my mom or dad and because I was, it, this was done to me. And I'm always blessed by Joyce Meyer's testimony, which she shares. She had a father who abused her. She was sexually abused as a child, but she also shares she forgave him. I'm not saying she, she, we don't have to agree with this, okay? But, but so far as she was concerned, she forgave it and, and moved on. Okay, and that's important for us to record. She, she didn't blame her father. Many times we think because of this one, because of that one, because of this and that and that. That's why I've got this problem. But the Bible says all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God through Christ Jesus is eternal life. So we need to take responsibility. An alcoholic will never be delivered from alcohol unless he admits he's got a problem and makes a plan to do something about this. But it's as long as he's blaming everyone else and shifting blame. And this thing is as old as time itself. When God walked in the garden, you know, we had the, the fall of man and Eve was tempted by the devil to eat the fruit and she gave into that. Um, she gave to her husband, Adam as well, and he ate of the fruit. That's a different message. And later on, you know, God didn't jump on them. <laughs> it says, in the cool of the evening in the garden, and you can picture this, it says God walked in the garden as he normally did and had communion and fellowship and confronted Adam, confronted the man. Why did you eat? You're the head of the home. Why did you eat of the fruit? And then the blame game started. Adam turned around and he blamed both his wife and God. He said, well, God, it's actually the woman that you gave me. <laughs> it's her, and it's actually you the one who gave her to me. She made me eat. And God then asked the woman, uh, why did you eat of, of the fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that I told you not to eat of? All of the trees you're allowed to eat. You see, that's the, how the way the devil works. We've given all the glory, all the gifts, all the wonderful things that God has given us that you can freely eat. But Satan will always tempt you to eat of the one thing that God has forbidden. And Eve said, well, it was actually the serpent who beguiled me. Now, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on, so he couldn't say anything. But nevertheless, each of them reaped a curse. Each of them reaped consequences. And I'll touch on that in a moment, not too in depth. I just want to give an overview this morning. But there's consequences when we break God's word, his law, when we, we disobey. Yes, there is forgiveness if we earnestly repent, but there are consequences. And again, you know, David was forgiven wonderfully. And even in Acts, David is called a man after God's own heart. But man, the consequences that he reaped, the rape, the murder, the devastation, he reaped hellfire, I can tell you. Driven rebellion. It marred his testimony. But God in his grace forgave him, but I can tell you it's not worth it. I'll never forget something that uh, a preacher from New York he was ministering to the pastors one day, and to pastors, because we're all vulnerable <laughs> with these things, speaking about this as well. And he said, just think of it a moment, is 30 seconds of pleasure worth the destruction of your whole life and ministry? Is it worth the destruction of your family? 
You see, what do these things affect? It's, it's God first. We'll give an account to God. It affects myself, it, it, my reputation, my testimony, physically as well. If we read the Psalms, we see how David was affected in his body with disease. It affects our marriage. It affects our relationship. It's 30 seconds of pleasure. Now, maybe you haven't done that or don't intend to do that, but be aware of what Jesus is speaking about here. That's why he's using that language that we can understand and also that we can help others, that we can help others and minister to them. Take personal responsibility. You know, the devil likes to work in the dark. If we do have a problem with this, then approach someone you can trust. Okay, there's a big who you can trust. Maybe a pastor if you're in another church or whatever the case. But, but go and confess it and speak to someone about it. And that's amazing. The minute we do that, the minute we take responsibility, you are already, there's already the beginnings of release. But as long as it's covered up, there's guilt and there's all of this sort of stuff and, and mental anguish and all of this, it, it destroys you and you're in bondage. You can never get out of it unless we take personal responsibility. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So as long as we hide it, as long as we want to shift blame, as long as we continue with it, we can never be healed, nor can others around us. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. One of the big problems, and that's that article I was reading with Pure Desire Ministry as well, is that... Um, Many Christians, they've done surveys, are okay with it. It might surprise you. They've got no problem using porn regularly. They don't, see it, they don't see it as destructive. They don't see a problem with it. And they say, but why can't I, I do this? You know, it helps me in some manner or another. You see, not accepting... Responsibility, just saying, well, God is a love of God of love, He's a God of grace, you know, God will allow this, but the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible warns much. Our forefathers, <laughs> Paul speaks about in First Corinthians chapter ten. They fell. They never reached the promised land, they never reached the place that God had designed for them. They fell in the wilderness. Because of these things, sexual immorality, they rose up to play, idolatry, complaining, all of these things, they yielded to it. First John 1, first John chapter 1, 8, 10, we know it well, but I'm talking about taking responsibility here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we're saying, but this is okay, you know, God is okay with this, I'm under the blood of Jesus and and so forth and so forth. God is a God of love. But it says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, there we have it again. Ownership, acknowledgement, confession. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Not just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that promise and that theme is consistent throughout the Bible. Victory over these things starts with confession and acknowledgement, repentance, a commitment to, to leave it behind and to, to follow God. I just want to say, and I don't want to go too much into this, I've mentioned a moment ago that if you're really in bondage to these things, you need to speak to someone and get some help. Okay, especially people who have overcome these things. And I can recommend Pure Desire Ministries. Um, but other people you can trust. 
Proverbs 15, 22 says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. But don't keep it hidden. Thirdly, this morning, as we look at it, how can I move from lust to life? How can I move from illicit desire to pure desire? Believe that the temptation and sin, as I said, can be resisted and overcome. When we allow ourselves to go down the path of of temptation and allow these things and become enticed, Satan becomes involved. But the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. As blood-bought children of God, by his authority, we can resist the devil and overcome what he's trying to do in our life. So believe that we can overcome it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, as I spoke to you a moment about speaking about how not to do things. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So none of us can say, but you know, what I'm facing, the things I'm dealing with is too strong for me. I cannot overcome it, even if it's a sinful thing. In other words, what Paul is saying over here, they didn't have to do this because they drank of the same rock, spiritual water from the rock of Christ. They were baptized with the same baptism as we are baptized. These were figurative. They were delivered from uh, the the old nature, uh, uh, from Egypt. They had all the oracles of God, they had the law of Moses, the word of God, but yet they chose. It wasn't that they had to fall, but they chose to fall. They chose to fall. That is an amazing promise. I've uh, I've often thought, you know, if I often had to come into very severe persecution, like many are going through around the world, as we sit and speak here, Uh, we need to just know (laughs) what the Scripture says, that God will not allow us to be tempted or tested beyond what we are able to bear, but with the test or the temptation, He will make the way of escape. Let me just touch on a few things there very quickly. First of all, all temptation is common to man. When I quoted some figures this morning, (laughs) some stats... Just as then, it is now, these things are common to man. But just because something is popular does not make it permissible, according to the Scriptures. What did Jesus say about the broad and narrow roads? And it's a sad thing. Sometimes things become unscriptural. Things become popular in the church. And Christians think, well, everyone is doing that. It's okay. But it's not okay if God says it's not okay. And we need to understand that this morning. I'm not speaking from a a legalistic point of a year. This is written to born-again Christians. So all temptation is common to man. As I said, we see over there God is faithful and not allow you to be tempted more than you will be able. He will make the way of escape. In whatever situation we're in, We need to just pray and say, Lord, what is the next step? It can be different types of tests and temptation. It can be money things. It can be relationship things. It can be marriage things. It can be what we're talking about here and just say, Lord, what do you want me to do? As I've been saying this morning, if it's something we need to confess, confess it. And, And do an about turn from it. The choice of victory is mine. The choice of victory is yours. And as I said a moment ago, we need to approach it from a perspective of victory. Now, it's interesting. I heard a pastor once speak from Davyton up on the reef. And I've always remembered it because it was such a powerful statement. And uh, he said the following. 
He said, man doesn't go to hell because of the many things done. Men go to hell because of the one thing left undone. You see, if we reject Christ, we might have our reasons for that, all of our sin is going to come upon us and we're going to face judgment. And that's why he made that statement. So man doesn't go to hell because of the many things done. And we all have sinned. That's what it says in John 3.19. It says, Jesus said before that, I've come not to condemn the world. I've come to that the world might be saved. He that believeth in me is not condemned. We are already in a state of life. We don't have to wait to find it if I've got eternal life one day. You believe in Jesus, you're following Jesus, you have life. But he also carries on to say, he who does but not believe in me, he rejects me, is already condemned. He's in a state of death. And that's important that we might recognize. And Jesus said, and what I quoted from that pastor a moment ago, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. And sometimes people can get uncomfortable when you speak about these things because you actually touch on things that they love and want to try and make excuses to continue to do and so forth. But we need to, we need to be aware of that. There we've got it, light. That, that's the condemnation. The only begotten Son of God has died for us to give us eternal life, whoever believes in him. But if we love our sin, if we enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Fourthly, this morning as I conclude, see the devastating consequences of sin. and sinful habits. The devastating consequences. Jesus is not taking the subject lightly, nor, nor does the epistles, nor does the Old Testament. I mean, if you read Proverbs about adultery and so forth, it speaks about hellfire. There are consequences. And as I said, there are three persons effective. There's God, first of all. David, when he confessed, he said, Lord, against you I've sinned. He recognized that he had violated the law, the moral law of God. He was suffering tremendously under the guilt of bloodshed. He had arranged that Uriah be killed, murder. And he was struggling with that. There are tremendous consequences. I've been through a few, a moment or two Ago. Uh, Brad Huddleston, um, he's expert on addictions and things like pornography, also a minister of the word and traveled all over the world and worked a lot with universities and, and studied the behavior of the brain connected with addiction. And in the studies that he done, he's actually uh, been to our conferences and stuff, and we've showed stuff of him even to our parents some years ago. And, uh, but very enlightening and revealing when I talk about consequences. You're saying pornography, what it does is it releases dopamine. Now, dopamine, we all have it. Is it a feel-good thing that, that makes us feel good? But obviously... Drugs, powerful drugs, enhance it, and it goes way over board. And it says, when people are con uh, addicted to pornography, the dopamine effects are the same as heroin. They've done studies of this, I mean, uh, intensive studies, and it says the effects are as if you're taking heroin. You see, a drug works like this, you, you, you take a little... And you're satisfied, but soon after that, you need more of it. And that's why they become addicts. It's the same with porn. 
You might start off with light stuff, not too serious. But the more you look at it, the brain then wants something more. It wants something more explicit. It wants something more vile. Ted Bundy, I think, has passed away, but if you look at the history of some of these people, serial killers and rapists, it started with pornography. It started with pornography, and it continues. So these things continue and actually alter the brain. They actually affect the brain and can be absolutely devastating. So we need to, there, there's consequences. I don't need to mention sexually transmitted diseases. But spiritually, Paul says, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. Just think about it. How can you, you take your members and be joined with a prostitute? Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy, uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I love the, and of course the consequences is it defrauds others. God has made women and men, and God has special gifts. The Bible says marriage is a gift. And David was judged because he had many sheep, but he took the one little sheep that the man dearly loved, despite having all those sheep. And this is the greed of the whole thing. There are many men and women out there and young people, and, but you know what? They're not made for your greed. They're not made for my lusts or your lusts or greed. I'm not saying we are. I'm just using figures of speech over here. God has put them there for others. It defrauds. That's what adultery does. It defraud, defrauds our brother. We're trying to take someone that is a gift to someone else that violates the law of love. Let's talk about love, but that violates the law of love. Job 31 verse 1 2 says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Listen. He's one of my favorite people in the Bible. He's falsely accused. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl or woman. For what is a man's lot or portion from God above? What is his gift or his heritage from the Almighty on high? Consequences. It displeases God. It defrauds our brother. It breaks marriages. It destroys relationships. It will destroy your body. The Bible says all sins that a man c commits uh, can be outside, but he who commits this sort of sin, sins against his own body. Understand the origins of temptation and sin. My time is up over here. Take responsibility for it. Believe that temptation can be resisted and overcome. And see the devastating consequences. Choose life. Choose life. Choose pure desire. And that's what we're saying yeah, this morning. And uh, I just want to conclude with a passage. And I've gone on a bit longer than I normally do. But that's okay. First Corinthians 6, verses 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals, thieves, the greedy drunkards, verbally abusive, and so forth, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, Paul says, about these things. Let us not lull ourselves into a thing while thinking, well, it's okay. You know, God is a love. 
God of love, and so forth. Some of you once lived this way, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful to me, but not everything is beneficial. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be controlled by anything. And that's the thing with these things. They control us and bring us into bondage. Verse 15 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that anyone who is united with a prostitute is one in body with her? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But the one united with the Lord is one in spirit with him. And again he says, flee sexual immorality. Flee it. Every sin a person commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the good gifts you've given to us. But we also know that the enemy would try and pervert, and the sinful nature would try and warp those gifts, Father. So, Father, I pray for us that we would take heed, Lord, to what your word says, that where necessary we'll take ownership. Father, we would live from a point of victory and deal with matters that need to be dealt with, but also from a perspective of helping others we know who may struggle in these areas. And so, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that we are not our own, but that we bought with a price. To be your children, to be heirs, Lord. And thank you for your word that is calling us upward, to live like heirs. To live as those who are going to be with you forever. And thank you that we're united with you, one, at the moment. As one with the Son and with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. So touch our lives, Lord. Touch every heart. Touch every life. We commit our way to you now, and we give you thanks for this. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord bless you. Thank you so much today for joining in.